Wow, could that be any more exciting? Welcome everyone. We're so excited you're here to join us for our live stream event all about Mars. My name is Rachel. I'm the staff astronomer at the Ontario Science Centre and I'm joined by a very special guest today, Dr. Cecilia Leung from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. So we've got a really exciting event for you planned today. We're really uh, excited to take all your questions. So any questions you have, please type them into the comments. Uh, we might have some questions for you throughout the program as well. Uh, while we certainly welcome uh, your questions and, and comments in the chat, anything that may be uh, uh, considered a bit inappropriate, those comments will be blocked uh, and deleted to ensure a safe and enjoyable experience for uh, everyone who else who is viewing the presentation. I wanna to begin today by acknowledging that I'm not at the Ontario Science Centre. I'm pretend, presenting to you from my home in Toronto, which is also the land where the Ontario Science Centre operates. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and is home of the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. As a settler, I'm so grateful to be able to live and work on this land alongside those who have cared for it since time immemorial. There are many of you who may be joining from outside of Toronto, and we're always encouraged to learn more about the treaties, the people uh, of the land that we live on. And you can learn a little bit more uh, using some websites that I found really uh, helpful. Uh, uh, they're available online uh, called whose.land or native-land.ca. We're gonna be talking quite a bit about Mars today, things that make Mars similar to Earth, things that make it different, and some things that you may have heard uh, talked about previously with regards to human spaceflight or traveling to other word, worlds, is the word colonization. And oftentimes words like colonization or, or the frontier uh, or settlements are often used when it's uh, used to describe human exploration of other planets. But historically on Earth, those have had quite negative connotations and impact on, on people, uh, particularly indigenous people. So to be more uh, uh, cognizant of that, we try to refrain from using any of that kind of language in our conversation today. And I encourage you to think about that too going forward when you hear those words used in the context of planet exploration. So I'm so thrilled. I already mentioned we've got Dr. Cecilia Leung here with us today uh, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so Cecilia, please tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and where you're presenting from today. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, I'm joining you from Pasadena, California, which is located on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva people. I'm not currently at the Jet Propulsion Lab either. I'm working from home during the pandemic. But um, right now, there are a lot of things are happening on lab and in preparation for the Perseverance landing tomorrow. So for myself at the Jet Propulsion Lab, I'm a planetary scientist that specializes on studying the present day water cycle. And so my research really combines the use of computer models as well as spacecraft observations to study the seasonal changes in the Martian atmosphere. And why would we wanna do that is because we wanna learn the long-term changes on Mars, particularly how that planet transformed from an earlier history where water could have flowed on the surface of the planet to today's much drier and arid environment. And of course, learning um, about the climate and weather um, is gonna help our Perseverance rover land on Mars tomorrow too, so that we're cognizant of what kind of um, weather system may be coming through the landing site, if there are any regional dust storms that um, the rover would need to be aware of. It's so interesting to hear that Mars has has weather, uh, and I think that that's something that we can definitely discuss a little bit more today. In addition to the history of water on Mars and some of those landforms, uh, I want to start off though by asking you a question, kind of about your childhood. What first got you uh, excited about state space? Like, when did you first decide you wanted to study space? Yeah, that's a great question too. So I, as a kid, loved going camping and looking up at the nice 
the sky and seeing all these stars in the sky and just like it, it evokes this sense of wonder and exploration and discovery. And so it's interesting that when you're looking at the night sky, the planets are just little specks of light, just like other stars. But when you use a telescope to start observing the planets, the details of these planets start coming into view. For example, we're able to see Saturn's rings and we're able to see even um, polar ice caps on Mars. And so what I got really interested in understanding about these planets is when we uh, when I learned more about space missions that are being sent there that includes um, orbiters as well as landers and rovers and when we're sending these robots to these different worlds now this speck of light in the sky now becomes all of this details come into view and that's just really exciting and I've and that's how I got into planetary exploration Thanks for sharing that. That's so awesome to hear. I think it's maybe safe to say that Mars is your favorite planet. Mars is definitely one of my favorite planets. I do like all, a lot of other planets and moons in the solar system and extrasolar systems as well. And of course, the Earth, too, is a planet in our solar system, and we love the Earth. I think Earth is one of my favorites where all the things I love are. Our, to our audience, what's your favorite planet? We would love to see in the chat. Let us know what your favorite planet is. And if you're joining us as a class, maybe you can have a vote as a class. Take a poll and see what the most popular planet is in your class. We've been getting a few uh, questions coming in about, um, about Mars related to what you were talking about, about weather. So the first question is Mars hot. <laughs> All right, so Mars is actually the next planet away from the Earth from the sun. So in terms of the temperature, it's actually colder on Mars than it is on the Earth. Um, the average temperature on Mars, actually, liquid water cannot be present in the current day's pre um, pressure and temperature on Mars. So it's a little bit colder than it is on Earth. And so... Um, in terms of the seasonal changes, though, the temperature is not the same year round. We get seasons on Mars just like we do on the Earth, and that's because Mars is actually tilted on its axis at 25 degrees, whereas um, on Earth we get about an axial tilt of 23 and a half degrees. So similar, they're similar in terms of that regards. And so when Mars is further away from the sun, it's a little bit cooler, and when it's closer to the sun, it's a little bit warmer. Now, the one big difference between Mars's orbit versus the Earth's orbit is that Mars's orbit is more elliptical. That means it's more oval in shape. And what happens there is that the temperature changes between its closest point to its furthest point is actually more extreme than what we do experience on Earth. And so in terms of seasons on Mars, you still get spring, summer, fall, and winter. And additionally, you get a season, the aphelion season, where it's furthest away from the sun, during that season, you get more water ice clouds when Mars is furthest away from the sun. And during the perihelion season, when Mars is closest to the sun, then you get a lot of dust storms during that part of the year. Oh, wow. That ties into the question that we've gotten. A couple people have been asking, what are storms like on Mars or are there storms on Mars? So you touching on what you just mentioned about these dust storms. Tell us a little bit about what it would be like to be inside a storm on Mars. Wow. Yeah, dust storm is a very big um, area of research on Mars because they're so incredibly um, ex the extensive in nature and they're ubiquitous on Mars too. Um, Mars doesn't have a global ocean like the Earth does and Mars dust storm actually happens very frequently. Um, there are different types of dust storms. There's small local ones where you can get a small dust devils or you can get a global dust storm where dust is lofted up very high into the atmosphere and it surrounds the whole entire planet. And so there are different dust storms that occur on Mars, depending on diff what season of the um, what seasons you are on Mars. And there, as I was mentioning a little bit before, um, when Mars is closest to the sun, it gets the most amount of solar heating. And so this amount of solar heating actually helps loft dust from the surface, where most of the dust comes from, high up into the atmosphere. And so um, some of those storms remain a regional dust storm, but other of those storms grow bigger and bigger into a global dust storms. And we still don't have a good idea about what causes 
um, a transition from a regional dust storm to a global dust storm. Global dust storms typically happens every four or five years on Mars. Um, and so we're still um, learning more about them as we are able to send more robots to Mars to learn them, to study these phenomena. That's so interesting. Can can you, can our, to our audience, can you imagine what a global dust storm might be like, a dust storm that surrounds the whole planet? And for reference, Mars is about half the size of the Earth. Is that is that correct, Cecilia? Yeah, the radius of Mars is about half of that of the Earth. And so um, when we're talking about um, the, the whole entire planet, we actually see very dramatic landforms. Um, we have one of the highest volcanoes in the solar system on Mars, that's called Olympus Mons. And we have um, one of the deepest canyons on Mars as well, and that's called Valles Marineris. Valles Marineris in particular spans the whole entire width of con the continental USA. And so you can just imagine the scale of these structures that um, are, are on Mars. And so that makes the landscape very dramatic when we look at it. It's so cool. I have a globe here that's kind of, it's a 3D printed, printed globe of Mars actually, which is cool because you can see there, so there's Valles Marineris that Cecilia was just talking about. You can see kind of like scar across the landscape and just along the edge, poking out along the edge there is sort of the mountain range. And there's, whoop, there's Olympus Mons that you said that's the tallest mountain in our solar system, taller even than Mount Everest? Yes, that's right. Oh my goodness, wow. We had a question related to that. Are there active volcanoes on Mars? What a great question, thank you for that. Yeah, so when we were just talking about um, Olympus Mons, that's the largest volcano, and right beside it, there were three other volcanoes too. And so combined, that region of Mars is called the Tharth Tharsis Montes, and so that's an ancient volcanic region. Um, currently, there's no um, eruptions that are currently active on Mars, but we're learning more about um, these volcanoes just be, by understanding the geological um, layers that are surrounding these areas. That's so cool. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about uh, sort of things that um, Mars has that are kind of similar to Earth, but to the extreme. It has canyons, but much deeper than we see on Earth. It has mountains or volcanoes, but much, you know, larger. Um, it also has seasons. Um, so there seems to be this interesting uh, comparison and contrast between the Earth and Mars. Is that why uh, we're so interested by Mars? Is this sort of how it's similar and yet different to the Earth? Absolutely. We have something um, in, in planetary sciences called comparative planetology. And so mm -hmm. what that means is that we, we use what we know from one planet, such as the Earth, but we also try to understand other planets from um, just these fundamental physics laws that we understand for the Earth and see if they apply to these other planets as well. And so um, we, no, and it's not just a comparison between Earth and Mars. We want to learn more about Venus and then how the three three um, terrestrial planets that are closest to the Earth, Venus, Earth, and Mars, um, they may have formed from similar material at the, er, uh, the beginning of the solar system formation, but as they currently stand, they, the three of them are very different. Um, on Venus, it's so hot and um, it is a very inhospitable um, area that uh, you can hardly um, able to survive even robots that are being sent there um, versus the Earth, which we live and are happy to live here and is habitable. And then, of course, Mars, um, it's gone from an era, from earlier history where potentially life form might have been able to survive and the environment was able to be um, supporting a habitable environment to today's environment. And so we we try to understand them all in context of one another. Um, what happened in the whole history of their evolution to form um, what we currently see about them today. Thanks for sharing that. And that ties into a lot of questions. We're getting a lot of questions about the presence of water on Mars. And you were talking a little bit about Mars's history, how it could have once been habitable, like maybe life could have uh, uh, been uh, present on Mars. 
Um, so before we get into talking about what ancient life on Mars could have been like, let's talk a little bit more about water. And um, first, let's start like, is there water on Mars today? And then maybe we'll talk a little bit more about its history. Yes, there's absolutely water on Mars today. But when we talk about water, it's not less necessarily in the liquid form of water that we are able to drink out of a glass of water, uh, out of a glass. <laughs> um, when we're talking about water on Mars, um, most of it, the majority of water on Mars today is locked up in the polar ice cap in the form of ice. And so solid water. And so um, exactly <laughs> on Rachel's um, 3D model, we can see the polar ice caps that is on the North Pole. And there's also a polar ice cap in the South Pole of Mars also. And so the majority of water on Mars today is locked up in those two polar ice caps. There are also other sources of water, such as subsurface ice sheets, um, as well as water that exists in the forms of um, water vapor and water ice clouds in the atmosphere. Oh. And so, yes, that we have a very active water cycle today, even today. Um, and mostly this happens um, when, again, with the seasons during the northern springtime, um, when the northern hemisphere gets a little bit warmer, the northern polar ice cap actually sublimates that ice water into vapor form. And so that vapor form gets carried from the northern hemisphere up into the higher atmosphere over to the southern hemisphere. And, and then of course, um, and then it, it resides in the southern hemisphere during that time. And then the flip side happens um, during southern springtime. The water reverses direction and goes back into the northern hemisphere. And so, as you can see, um, exactly, the water is constantly being transported um, in the regional and uh, global atmosphere dynamics of Mars. And then that's how we see um, uh, water ice cloud forms during certain times of the year. And of course, um, the water ice cloud is most active during northern spring, which is happening right now. Right now, we just celebrated a Mars New Year just a couple of weeks ago, and we have just entered northern springtime in Mars. So cool. So if there's water ice clouds, I guess that means there's snow. <laughs> yeah, we we're trying to detect that actually on the Phoenix Mars lander, which is another robot that we had sent to Mars um, uh, a little while ago now. That mission happened mostly in 20. 2008 and that particular robot landed in the north polar region and so that mission was able to observe something called fall streaks and so we have something similar to that happening on mars and, uh, so we have something similar happening on earth these fall streaks is actually ice crystals that fall from the sky you can observe a water ice cloud and then at nighttime these streaks um was observed using a Canadian instrument, the LIDAR instrument, to look at fall streaks of, on Mars. And so um, we haven't directly observed fluffy um, snowflakes on Mars yet, but we have uh, evidence that we do observe these fall streaks there. That's so cool. And uh, uh, of course, if it was Canadians who, who would have uh, detected <laughs> detected uh, uh, some, some traces of snow. And I forgot to mention at the beginning during my introduction that Dr. Leung is also a uh, Canadian, uh, currently working at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We're getting quite a few questions now about rovers. So I want to shift a little bit from talking about the planet, planet and its landforms and water uh, to talking about uh, what we might anticipate seeing tomorrow. So we started off the program today with that great video uh, from NASA showing the Mars 2020 mission uh, arriving uh, on the planet and that includes the Perseverance rover uh, and the Ingenuity helicopter. So it's an incredibly exciting event that is happening tomorrow, I believe. Uh, yeah. It's uh, around 3.30 uh, and uh, Cecilia will share with us towards the end of the program how you can all watch that. But I wanna touch on a couple questions that we're getting in uh, specifically about um, the rovers. So what happens to the other rovers on Mars after another rover lands? Do they just die? <laughs> no. So at NASA, as well as all of its partner agencies, 
we try to keep the rovers operating as long as possible. And so previously, previous to the Perseverance rover, we've sent a number of robots to Mars. Um, and so that includes orbiters that are um, orbiting around Mars, as well as the rovers and landers that are actually um, landing on the surface. And so there are currently still a number of previous robots, including the orbiters and rovers, still operating on Mars. Um, most recently, we had the InSight Mars lander. Um, it is still um, active and looking and listening for Mars quake. And we still have um, the orbiter, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and, and that's very active today still. And that's one of the primary um, orbiters that will be doing relay to send the signals from Perseverance back to Mars. And of course, for Perseverance, it's actually um, a follow on for another rover that's very similar to it, and that's the Mars Science Lab or Curiosity rover, and that landed in 2012. And that is still uh, obviously um, still alive and well today too. And we have a team of um, members that are all working um, and getting data back to us and scientists that are still learning um, a lot from these past um, robots. And that's just on the NASA side, on the European side, as well as um, internationally, there's just been a number of um, international partners that have been sending other robots to Mars this year as well, including the UAE as well as China. And so um, including the Mars Express rover, uh, the Mars Express um, orbiter and the Europeans are going to be sending another robot to Mars in a couple of years. We have a quite an international fleet of robots that are still operational today. I love that. I love that it's such a collaborative effort, that it's so many different countries that are involved that are working together to explore this other world. Um, you touched on this uh, a little bit briefly before, but I want to ask, uh, for the scientists that are working on these missions, um, I've often heard that they have to be on Mars time. Uh, we've gotten some questions about um, about you know, um, when was Mars New Year uh, and, and how do you measure uh, a time, the passage of time on Mars? And when scientists are working on these rovers, how do they, how do they sync up them, their day to be on Mars time? These are such wonderful questions. Um, so for the people that are working on emissions includes scientists like myself, but also engineers and communicators and educators. Lots of different people actually works on the mission all simultaneously. And so for myself, luckily for me, um, I do not need to work on Mars time. I primarily work with data that comes down, that has been um, communicated, sent from the rover to the Deep Space Network received on Earth and arriving at my computer. So I can wait, I have some time between when the rover collects data to when I see it on my computer to start working on it. Um, however, we also have a lot of other staff on the mission, um, including those who work on operations. And those people will actually have to work on Mars time because um, they're gonna have to send commands to the robots. Um, they wanna observe to make sure that it's in real time that the op, um, the robot is actually in good health. And so for those folks, they um, will be working on Mars time. And so a Mars- That's so funny. Day, <laughs> yeah, one day on Mars is um, 24 hours and about 39 minutes. And so oh, it's insane. a little bit more than an Earth day, not so much. But then if you're thinking every day, you're shifting by a little bit and a little bit, those folks that are working on Mars time in operations will be working maybe um, at 5 p.m. one day, but then another day, a few months later, they may have to be working at 1 a.m. in the morning. Oh dear. <laughs> we now have wanna shift to some questions that we have about living on Mars. First question I wanna ask our audience though, is how many of you would go to Mars if given the chance? I'll find, I want to follow up to, to the previous question I asked about favorite planets. We did see a lot of Earth, a lot of love for Earth, so that's good. Uh, we love our planet. We want to take care of it. Uh, Pluto, also very popular among classes, dwarf planet. Uh, good mix, lots of different favorites. So thanks for sharing those. And now I'm asking, 
which who of you would want to uh, go to Mars? Um, as for myself, I don't think I would want to go to space. I, uh, you know, I decided to be an astronomer because I like to study space from the Earth rather than to travel into space. What about you, Cecilia? Would you go to space if given the chance? Oh, that would be such an exciting opportunity um, if given the chance. I know a lot of the astronauts that are currently in training right now, um, some of their missions that they will be training for is to live in space. And that could include um, the ISS, we which we currently have humans on, but also future um, missions that will be going to the going back to the moon, um, as well as then future missions going to Mars. And so the current astronauts that are currently in training, as well as the upcoming astronauts that will be selected, will will be some of the first people that will be um, stepping foot on Mars. It's a very exciting time. Yeah, that's very exciting. About 80% of our audience says they would go. So you know what? Maybe one of you will be one of the first people to, to go to Mars or live on Mars. I think that uh, you know Mars, is we've seen, has a lot of similarities to the Earth. But I think it's different enough to pose quite a challenge for people to live there. Cecilia, could you share with us maybe what the biggest challenge is for humans going to Mars? Absolutely. We have one class who wants to know if they can go to Mars for a field trip, I think. <laughs> uh, would that ever be possible? Or what's the biggest challenge people are facing in going to Mars? So the currently, the biggest challenge is to have enough resources there for humans to be able to have a, a sufficient life support system. And that's because, first of all, a mission to Mars takes over eight months to arrive there. And a mission would be more like um, about two years for a journey there and journey back. It's not instantaneous that if some emergency happens, we'll be able to send help right away. And so we would need to be able to be self-sufficient. Um, the mission will need to carry all of the life support um, equipment for to sustain um, the livelihoods of those who are gonna be involved in the mission. And because Mars um, atmospheres is so much thinner, um, it does not have breathable oxygen in the quantity that we do have on Earth. Um, oh <laughs> and of course, it's also a very harsh radiation environment as well. Um, so we need to bring um, all of the space suits as well as build habitats that will be able to protect the humans that are going to be operating on Mars at that time. And um, currently, we do not have any um, food that is grown on Mars at the <laughs> moment. In the future, um, there are lots of studies that look at how we could um, grow vegetation and food on Mars. But at the moment, we don't have that yet. And so uh, any mission that is going to be sent there will also have to consider all of the sustenance that the astronauts will need during the whole entire duration of the mission. Wow. So many challenges. So I'm so glad all of you thought that Earth was one of your favorite planets because Mars doesn't sound like a very uh, ideal backup plan. Uh, we need to make sure we're taking care of the Earth while also exploring these fascinating worlds. Uh, one question that we got quite a lot towards the beginning, and I kind of want to touch on it before we wrap up today, and it's sort of related to why I decided to wear this color, is where does Mars get its red from? Why is it called the red planet? <laughs> yeah, so for the redness that comes from the surface is actually iron um, that's in the soil. And so that's usually when we think of rust, <laughs> it's a little bit brownish color. And that's similarly on the surface of Mars, you get some iron that is on the surface. When it reflects light, it becomes this reddish color. And that's why we call it the red planet. Oh, thanks for letting us know. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you so much to our audience for all of your questions. I've got one last question for you, Cecilia, and that is what are you doing tomorrow at 3.30? I'm so excited about the landing of Perseverance, just like a lot of our audience members are here as well. Um, so because I will, um, during the pandemic, only a limited amount of people will be allowed at the Jet Propulsion Lab to see it um, at, from, from the laboratory. I myself will be watching it um, a live stream on NASA TV, which is also publicly access accessible. And, and so the live stream will include the pre-landing as well as post-landing briefings, as well as information 
about the mission. And so that's on NASA TV starting. Um, the programming starts today and goes into tomorrow. And so I hope you'll join me there. That's so awesome. I know I'll definitely be watching and I hope many of you will be watching as well. We can share a link in our chat uh, so you can find out a little bit more about where you can watch uh, the live stream event of landing and Perseverance has got many cameras on it. So it's capturing uh, its descent in a lot of detail because Mars is quite far away from us. It takes time for uh, that data to reach us. So some of those images might start to come out in a few days later. So don't just don't just tune in tomorrow. Keep your eye on the news mm -hmm. and on NASA's websites uh, for updates on the Perseverance mission and get to see all these exciting uh, new science that's coming uh, out of this, this fantastic new mission. I want to thank all of you for all your incredible, incredible questions. Uh, I have one last question for you, and is that we would love your feedback on what you thought of this event. We're going to put a link to a survey in the chat, and you can let us know what you thought. Uh, we always love to hear from you as we learn about uh, your thoughts on our programs and what you would like to see in the future. I mentioned, you know, NASA has a lot of great resources available all about this upcoming mission, but the Ontario Science Centre is doing a lot of programming all around a countdown to Mars. So please check out our website and subscribe to our newsletter to hear about the latest events and activities. Next up, tomorrow night, starting at 7 p.m., we are having a virtual star party together with our friends from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. And so I hope you will join us all uh, for that event as well. And thank you again, Dr. Leung. Any final words for our audience about Mars? I'm so excited that we're all talking, learning more about Mars and hope that um, we'll see some future planetary scientists and explorers out there. Yes, absolutely. I hope so as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and stay safe. Bye. Bye.